Greetings, Grand School members. This is Characters, and welcome back to the ongoing series that is How to Master the Game of Six Max Zoom. This is episode number five, and today we're going to be doing mostly a live play video, but there is a little bit of theory to get into just before we get into the action. And the topic is the three targets of exploitative adjustment. Last time, we talked at great length about balance and what it actually meant theoretically. We used the whole rock, paper, scissors analogy to talk about that. And we discussed um, times when it was really important to be balanced defensively. The times we want to actually make sure that we're not giving any potential adjustment to our opponents unnecessarily. That would be higher EV than they themselves playing a balanced strategy. We talked about why that's crucial, but today I want to talk about why it's actually really important um, to go the other way sometimes as well and be exploitative. So let's get right into it basically. I would say that if you've not watched the start of this series, I'd go back and start watching it from the beginning. Like I will be following a logical progression. I'm intro introducing theoretical notions one by one as and when they become applicable. And I'm trying to build up a foundational core to understanding the theory of being a winning six max no limit hold'em cash zoom player. And like if you've missed something from earlier on in the series, it's going to be kind of difficult to follow certain parts, especially when we're doing like revision and recap and then leading on to something else. So definitely stop watching now and go back and watch this from the beginning. This is episode five of the four other episodes if you've not done that. So last time we talked about the importance of being balanced when clueless as to what a more profitable strategy might be. Now, this is important because there's nothing wrong with adopting an exploitative strategy as long as you have a reason to do it and you think it's actually going to be higher EV than a balanced strategy. If you don't have a reason to do it and you don't think it's going to be a better adjustment than playing a balanced strategy, then what you're doing is you're just stabbing around in the dark. Maybe you're playing a good strategy. Maybe you're playing a bad one. You're not gaining any known EV. And indeed what's happening is that you're offering your opponents a highly effective or some kind of more effective than balance exploitative strategy of their own that they can find to play against you. So it's okay to enter that war of exploitability, if you like, and try to exploit them, do it at the right frequency so that they don't notice or do it loads and then readjust them or whatever. As long as you've got a reason to do it in the first place and you're not just literally playing an unbalanced strategy for no good reason, opening yourself up to being exploited without gaining anything. So the platinum rule was exactly that. Thou shalt play as close to balance as you are capable, unless making a known EV gain versus an individual player, a player type or population where it's not the case that by making that gain you're offering a more profitable counter adjustment that the target is likely to find. So this is really relevant for today. We're going to talk about targets of adjustment, these three types of um, entities that we can adjust against if you like. Individual players, like villain is a fish, I'm called blah 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 and on the note box for this fish I have a specific note telling me that he called a ridiculous hand on the river, so he's obviously over calling his range in the river, he's calling way too much, and therefore I know how I can play against this player. I can basically just start bluffing way less and value betting, or just not bluff at all and value bet all my hands down to like thinner than I would normally value bet. So I'm basically playing a very exploitative, unbalanced strategy where I just always have a value hand when I bet the river, and that's fine. So today we're going to discuss how it can be equally important to play exploitatively as soon as we gain enough information to know of a higher EV alternative to the balance strategy. Just as it's important to be balanced when you don't have a reason to do otherwise, it's also super important to be exploitative as soon as you do have a reason to do otherwise. And what we're going to talk about today is something I call the target specificity of exploitative adjustments. How specific are the targets going to be? Is it going to be against an individual? Which is very specific because we actually know something about the way this player thinks and behaves on the poker table that leads us to a very specific exploitative adjustment. Is it going to be against a player type? So villain is a fish, fish generally don't fold much therefore we're going to underbluff. Villain is a tight player, they fold their blinds too much therefore we're going to oversteal our range and under defend it to three bets. Sorry, excuse me, I've got a bit of a cold or something today, I don't know, just kind of woke up um, with that kind of like feeling that there was congestion that would normally be there, kind of annoying. Um, 
Anyway, or is it going to be against the population? The population check folds too much when they check its preflop raiser, or the population doesn't 3-bet enough against early position opens, but 3-bet's too much against button opens. You don't need to know anything about an individual player to find an adjustment, as long as you know a little bit about the reg population or the player type at hand. This is important. People tend to commit what I would what I would call and probably have described earlier in this season in this series, I think, as the infoless therefore net fallacy. I'm not sure if I actually introduced that or not earlier on in a different video. I may have, I may not have. So the lack of info therefore be a net um, readless therefore net fallacy, I think I call it in my book, which is the idea that the the completely f like flawed idea logically that if you don't know anything about your opponent at all, then you should just be a net. You should be super unbalanced. No, you shouldn't, because if you do that, you're kind of just for some reason offering your opponent an exploitative adjustment for no reason. You're committing an offence against the platinum rule, which is more important than the gold rule, which is more important than the silver rule, and the copper rule, and the wooden rule, and all the rules below that. Don't violate the platinum rule, it's pretty expensive, you know? So by playing like a net against someone you don't know, you're just basically saying, hey, look, I don't bluff. Like, just you know, fold against me because I play like a net because I'm afraid that I might adopt a strategy that's bad. Well, if you adopt a balanced strategy, it's never going to be bad. That's the thing. It might be lower EV than X strategy that you don't know about. But if you don't know about X strategy, you can't do it. It's like me sitting here in my house right now and being like, you know, there's a £20 note lying probably somewhere on the ground around this area that someone's dropped. And, you know, I feel bad about sitting there when I know that's out there, but I can't find it. Why would I go looking for it? It's the same thing here. You don't know, villain. You don't know what the right way to play is against them, even though one probably that does exist. There probably exists an exploitative strategy that's good. That doesn't mean that you want to net it up. That means that you want to play balance and not offer him a way to exploiting you. So don't just net it up because that's very unbalanced. 2005 logic needs to just go down the drain. Forget it. So we can exploit either of these three players, an individual, a player type, or a population. Each of these three things, levels of specificity, if you like. And what that looks like in a kind of nice diagram is this. And this is the figure that we're going to have on screen today when we are going through our live play session. We're going to have pure balance in the middle, which is where we are. We have absolutely no reason to think that the player type, the villain himself, or even the population is unbalanced in a spot. It's a spot that the population generally plays quite well. That's to say, plays in a balanced way. And therefore, we have no reason to do otherwise than play a balance by ourselves, because then if we didn't, we'd be violating the platinum rule. But more often than not, we're just not even going to be starting in this purple zone at all. We're going to be kicking off, most times, in the red zone of exploit the population. And that's just because in the games that most of you guys play who are watching this video, you're probably not playing like 500 NL Zoom, you're not dealing with guys that are really balanced all the time, you're dealing instead with populations that are just too tight in many 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 spots or even too stationary in others and it's your job as a regulator of those games to figure out which spots it is that your opponents are in unbalanced in in lots of different ways and design default strategies like we spoke about at the end of last time <coughs> excuse me I'm just kind of like yawning and coughing all over the place today um we're designing default strategies that are actually designed against a population to exploit the population, they're not balanced strategies, and that's going to be higher EV than having a balanced strategy. Because in poker, our job is not to just always be defensive, it's to make the most money. It's just that when we don't have a route, when we, I don't know where that £20 note lies on the ground, it's not a good idea for me to just go around looking for it, because I'm not likely to stumble upon the best strategy. I mean, I could, but I'm not gaining anything by doing that. So... Our job is to, as soon as we see an available exploitative adjustment, we seize it, we jump on it, and we exploit it. Then we can talk about exploiting player types. If we know one better info level than just what the population does, we might know what a sub part of the population does. We might know that the tight regs in our game in Zoom just fold their blinds so ridiculously that we should steal close to any two cards on the button in the small blind and we should decrease our small blind sizing down from 3x to 2.5x. 
we might know that aggressive regs don't balance their forward bluff range and they forward bluff way too wide and therefore we should shove wide, which is actually a read that I have in my population, as you probably know if you've watched my live play videos. Or we might know that we might know that when regs ISO fish, they underdefend their range, like tight regs just do not defend their range after the ISO fish well at all because the pot's like bigger and they're like afraid, which is also a true read that I have. So you get population reads and you get like subtype of population reads like they're actually about player types, fish, nets, whatever you want, whatever you want, like all kinds of player types you can infer things about how they're likely to play that leads you to plus EV exploitative adjustments that are more plus EV than a balanced strategy would be. Then we have exploiting villains specifically when you have like an actual read on the player, like he's just seen me do this, he thinks I'm a maniac, he saw me bluffing, I think he's going to call me down lighter because he's like a straightforward thinking aggro fish that saw me bluff, so he's never going to fold to me in future, therefore I won't bluff. Or I have a note in villain from last week saying that he doesn't understand X concept and he plays his range in X way because of it, so I'm going to exploit him. Player notes, HUD stats over decent samples, that kind of thing. This is the figure we're going to have on screen, we're going to talk more about it as we then fire up three tables of 50nl zoom. And I'm going to basically go into times I'm completely balanced, times I'm exploiting the population, times I'm exploiting a player type, and times I'm exploiting an individual villain. This will be the rarest by far. In Zoom, we're most often going to be here and sometimes here. And rarely here or here. Like These are like the extremes. We're normally just in this red or cream zone, beige, whatever that is. We're rarely going to be on the outskirts where we actually know really specific things. And we're rarely going to be at the absolute balanced core. I thought this was the best way to do it. Reminds me of like a planet. We've got like the, the core and the mantle and the surface and then an atmosphere or something like that, I guess. I recall that pretty well. I just wanted to challenge myself there. See if I could remember the different parts of a planet. I think that's right. Anyway, without further ado, let's play some poker and show this in action. Here are my four tables. I'm going to be jumping on them very soon. I just need to take a very quick break. And then I'm going to be right back with some live poker action. Okay, let's fire up the tables. So, blind versus blind, I almost have enough of a read here, sorry that HUD is 24 hands, you can quite see it there, to be unbalanced towards actually over bluffing the spot, because I feel like nets are just gonna like folding here way too much. 810 suited would normally be um, a part of my range that I would fold, it wouldn't be quite good enough to flat here, just about, I mean it's not far from a flat, um, and it would equate to, I'd normally favour um, suited hands here in my bluff range, but I'm actually going to just widen my bluff range a little bit just because this guy is so far 17-13 um, with 100% fold to 3 bet, I mean it's kind of like a little bit marginal to widen my range just based on that because it's a very small sample. Um, but that's how I would that's how I would do it. I don't think it's bad to like widen my range a little bit there and sort of use the top offsuit folding part of it as a three bit bluff. It does equate to me bluffing quite a lot in this spot. But I think it's usually gonna be good against a typical zoom tightish regular kind of player. See bit a little bit on the bigger side because it is a flop that I check back a fair bit because it's quite good for his range and not like amazing for mine. And that's a very bad turn for for my hand really, like it does give me like a few, a bit more equity, but it also improves his range a lot. I think it's one that I don't have much full equity on and I'm not gonna use a hand with a 10 in it as a showdown value, as a triple bluff here. So I'm actually just gonna like to check back the turn. He leads river. Um, in terms of better hands here, you can have like king 10, ace 10 for sure. Um, he could have like a queen east then value betting. I don't think this is good enough to raise. I think it's just a clear call to be honest. I don't think there's much else I can do. I could consider raising exactly against hands like ace queen and king queen that are value betting there. But I just oh that was an unmeant unintended timeout. Um, but I don't think there are really enough hands of that nature of just top pair. I don't even know that he bets all his queens on that river. Um, for me to raise that river with just 10x there. There are better 10s in his range, there are some straights in his range, so my hand's just not nothing enough to raise for value there. Flopping top here all over the place, which is nice. So, so yeah, that spot there, I mean, it's just the, the kind of situation where I'm widening my range because I think that the typical zoom net, I've got a kind of exploit player type 
read there it's a small sample but I do think he's going to be like really tight and stuff in general king eight's just about good enough for me to call especially when we flop top here on absolutely every single pot that we play that's kind of nice so normally I would fold 10-8 but because I, he seems tighter I just think it's less likely I get 4-bet absurdly wide I think it's more likely he overfolds his range and so I just decide to stop over bluffing in that spot because I have somewhere between the red and the yellow there, somewhere between the player type read and the um, population read basically. And well, it's not even that I think the population like overfolds that spot particularly. Um, I think they do fold a fair bit blind versus blind, so maybe they do overfold a little bit in the red zone there, but it's actually like jumping kind of from pure balance to a player type read more than anything else. So we check all that flop top, flop top pair again because stars is rigged today that characters always flops top pair. And we make a big bet in this river. We do have bluffs and things. So we're gonna polarize our range, try and get called by Queen X or even he rode by like a deuce or something sometimes as well, I think is reasonable for villain to do. So um, this board, I think we're a bit too strong to put this into our check call range. We have worse jacks here that we can check call with. I think King Jack is a hand we can actually go for three streaks with. Um, each jack will three bits pre some amount of the time. This guy's 1917 um, so far. I need to fix my HUD colors out. They're completely messed up, which is just going to be a call with Ace Queen here. I'm going to three bet more polarized, and so Ace Queen is sort of too good to turn into a bluff, not good enough to three bet for value in this situation. Villain checks quickly, and now I have a population read that they check fold a lot in this spot in general. And so I don't know. I don't think there's that many. There is some Ace X I can get three streaks from here for sure. Um, it's kind of close, I guess. I would bet, like, I bet most of my range here. I think they are check folding this spot quite a lot, but I could actually, I think I'm going to make an exploitative adjustment and actually check here because I feel like they're probably just on this board, honestly. Like, I want them to delay C bet against me. And I feel like on that flop, particularly, they are check folding the flop quite a lot. I just don't think they check all that many A6 there. They'll check call some. But like when they have ace-queen themselves, ace-jack, I think they just bet the flop a lot of the time. They're kind of unbalanced. Their check raise, their check fold range, or their checking range on the flop, I should say, is just going to contain like loads of combos of like pocket pairs that are either check folding right away or they're only calling one street. So there's really no rush to get any value from those hands right away because I'm not getting three streets. There are very few. My read is that the population is not check calling ace-10, ace-jack enough there and then check calling three streets. They're more just check folding abundantly on that flop. That I think that there's no reason exploitatively to bet ace queen on that flop, even though it would probably be a bet and a balanced strategy because it's too high up in my range not to stab. If I'm stabbing like a bunch of bluffs, I need that in my value range. So it's a spot where a balanced strategy is definitely going to have me um, betting that flop, but because I think they are just check folding by the river so often there, I think it's actually a pretty clear um, flop check because I expect them just to be. I want I want to allow them to delay C bet basically, and I think that they will delay C bet a lot of those flop give up, give ups quite a lot, and therefore in practice, exploitatively speaking, against the population, it's just a lot better for me to go ahead and check back with Ace Queen there than it is for me to to stab it. Just about extracting value from unbalanced ranges, like they're unbalanced, they open up a hole, like we saw last time. I the exploitative monster step into that hole, the exploitative adjustment monster, I should say. And I make an adjustment of checking, slow playing my ace queen there because I feel like it's not ever getting three streaks really and their range is going to give me money, more money on the turn if I let it bet the turn. And yeah, basically it's going to be higher EV than the balanced alternative would be. I'm just going to continue checking down deuces, probably check full into a bet. Um, I just have very little realizable equity against a the fish there. It's very much an exploitative spot where I just don't feel like I need to defend much of my range there at all. Um, Ace-Jack, we face a squeeze from someone that's pretty tight so far. We're going to go ahead and fold. This is close to an exploitative. This probably is an exploitative fold, honestly, and it's based on the read that regs don't squeeze bluff enough against early position opens. They tend to be more value orientated in that spot. And so I'm exploiting the population again. Like I said, normally we are very much going to be in this sphere of exploiting the population here in the sort of mantle section of the earth. Uh, because it's just going to be higher EV than pure balance. Pure balance there would probably have me like 4-bet ace-jack off as a bluff, to be honest, maybe. I'm not sure. It might be close between like a flat and a... F it might even be a flat if it's high up and enough in my range that I have to defend it there. I'm not sure. It's kind of borderline. It might not be a clear flat. It might be like a 4-bet bluff or even a fold, but clearly I'm going to overfold my range in that spot because I don't think the population bluffs enough 
in that situation. We get three bit really small here by someone who's silver star, so we're gonna definitely set mine. Pocket threes, we're just getting easily a good enough price. Play these three hands at once. This spot, the population, I don't know this guy, but the population is just basically betting. Um well, this is probably a fish actually with his pre-flop sizing and his 50 zero stats. The population is definitely overfolding this spot anyway, so I'm gonna be betting this hand regardless, basically, of the population. This is a bet in a balanced strategy as well, but I might exploit the adjustment with my range there with my own strategy. Remember, a strategy is a bunch of hands over the long run and not just one hand. My exploitative counter strategy there is definitely going to be to stab more of my range than would be balanced in that situation. I think Ace Nine is still too low down in my range to, sorry, too high up in my range to bluff River with. Um, is it a call as part of a balanced strategy here? This is a spot where I don't know anything about the population and their propensity to bluff this river. I'm not really sure that I think they're quite balanced in this spot actually. So I'm going to revert to balance myself. I block flushes, which is not a big deal. Um, how much is this high up enough in my range that I can call? I do have King X and stuff. I think it's not quite high enough, so I'm just going to play balance there and fold that hand. Although it's definitely not a million miles away. Population does four bet. They, they're kind of balanced in this spot, like defending the three bets here. I don't think they overfold dramatically. So for me to three bet King 10, I'd need to be exploiting a population that folded far too much to three betting in that spot, basically. Here, I'm going to be exploitative based on player type because this guy is such a net in a small blind. It makes my combined equity from both blinds a lot larger. And therefore, I should just be in a better place to... Um, win the blinds and I can widen my steel range and steal close to like 70% there than like the 40% I would normally use. Maybe like 50, 60 actually. Don't want to open myself up to getting totally abused by the big blind. Flop is a spot that I'll be balanced in. I'll play what I think the optimal strategy is and it's a clear check in any kind of balanced strategy because it's very stable and vulnerable showdown value that I need to balance with my air. When I check air back there, I need to check back some hands I can call turns with or bet on the turn for value and things like that. So it's definitely just a flop check back in a balanced strategy. So that's what we're going to do. We river the meaningless two pair. Is it too thin to bet here? Well, I can get value from, I don't think he has a queen very often at all when he just takes this line of check calling um, turn, just exploitatively. I just don't think he has much queen x. Um, I'd be trying to get called by 9x. Diamonds have just got there as well. I think it's a little too thin to actually bet this river. So I'm going to go ahead and just check it back. That's kind of like the thing. Like, I mean, you shouldn't make bad value bets just for the sake of balance either. Like you should only value bet the hands that you think are plus EV to value bet and then you should go from there balancing your air with that. I'm going to range bet this flop as part of a balance strategy. It's just very hard for him to do much about that and it should be the best way for me to make a bunch of money. King Queen, again, don't know the population. They bluff kind of optimally in this spot. They're not like super value orientated or bluff heavy. So again, just going to play balance and it's a very clear call because it's not low down enough in my range to four bet bluff despite the good blockers. Eights, I'm just going to fold here because the burden of defense really lies on the cutoff as the opener there. I don't have to play a hand like eights to a three bet in that spot, although it might be kind of borderline okay. Here we don't flop any backdoor flush draws. I mean, we will sometimes. This flop is one that's very hard for us to defend on. It is one that we have to accept our opponent just does well on because he has enormous range advantage there, given that he has all the big over pairs and we have very few pocket pairs in relation to him. Um, well, we do have some, but they're generally like lower down pairs than the ones he has. And I do have like ace queens and ace jacks that can call their offsuit or suited with backdoor flush draws. So with king queen, me to defend that flop kind of balanced, I probably want to be only calling the king queens that have a backdoor draw. Otherwise, if I just call king queen off there, I'm definitely over calling my range in that flop to a c bet, which is not really good in a spot where my opponent has range advantage and can definitely be barreling a lot on later streets. Queen jack is just part of it, it's just a call in any strategy here, balanced or most exploitative strategies as well. The only exploitative strategy that I would actually 3-bet this hand in would be against the fish who was basically um, calling way, way too many 3-bets and then just like playing fair or fold and folding a lot post-flop and stuff like that. This is a river that just due to the... This is another way you can make an exploitative adjustment actually. It's not really based on the population, it is kind of, but it's just the fact that on this river card, people don't fold ever. Like... They, they fold very rarely. So I should actually underbluff my range, I think. What the hell? I think I should underbluff my range in that spot because I just feel like the run out has made, just makes the population play their range in a way that equates to them overcalling their range on the river. Therefore, I should underbluff. So oftentimes, you know nothing about anything, like not even the population. 
as such. That's not technically a population read, I don't think. That's just more like that texture runs out and people's ranges are X, therefore they don't fold enough of it on the river. Therefore, I should underbluff. Kind of weird that he shows up with a worse hand than me there and chooses to, to play it that passively. It's just never, that's just never good. I mean, this guy's clearly a fish, actually. He just doesn't see bet the gutter on the flop. And he just calls turn. I mean, calling turn's reasonable, but if you're going to call turn and not bet that river that with five high, that's just absolutely atrocious. Like, it's so bad, I can't even explain it. It's terrible. Like, look at his strategy. I mean, he's literally taking a zero showdown value hand, which is, like, one that you must bluff on that river, where I have a ton of give-up check folds, and not that many check calls. I don't leading 10x on the turn. It's hard to see what I'm ever check calling in that river, actually. I'm probably really balanced it, unbalanced there myself, just accidentally due to how the boards run out. And so, like, okay, if I was striving for total balance, I would check call some of my worst ace or something like that. But I don't know if I actually do in practice. And anyway, he should just be betting, like, the very bottom of his range there for fold equity. Like, it's ridiculous not to. So definitely a weaker player, probably a fish, in fact, I would think. 10-9 <clears throat> here is, I can't flat this, as a 13% squeezer ahead, so it's just going to be, it's going to creep into my 3-bet range here. My 3-bet range can be linear and still contain this hand just because it flops really well and it's good board coverage and that kind of thing. My range overall is very strong. Like, a linear range isn't necessarily what the poker stove type program will tell you is the top X percent. It's in terms of playability and suitability and cash as well. Um, I think 10-9 suited is, is close, but I think it creeps in there for sure um, into a linear or a polar strategy in this kind of spot. Well, a polar strategy, you'd be flatting it, but we're not going to be polar out of the small blind unless... Unless villain is villain behind us in the big blind is very rarely squeezing, and we know that. Going to be a little bit unbalanced here because this player type read, this is probably a weaker player which entices me just to open up a bit wider. Also a tight, weaker player, which gives me a lot of fold equity either on the flop or a pre-flop. So I can definitely <clears throat> be overfolding my range to a 3-bet because I gain more EV by opening in the first place and just be playing like a very, um, or fairly unbalanced strategy in that spot. So that's a case where player type read again comes into action. And as you see here in Zoom, like we're just not getting any individual player reads. All our reads so far are population or player type or just situational. <clears throat> Like, all the spots <clears throat> we think our opponents un and balanced in, unbalanced in, is a spot where it's based on player type or population. Like, we don't know anything as specific. This is probably a call on the right here. People will see this flop all day. I have a back their flush draw. Um, it's probably not a lead. I think that would equate to leading the turn, like, far too wide if I was to lead this hand. So I think it's just a check fold with queen high. has enough showing of value. Don't need to turn it into a bluff. I have hands like flush draws there that I can lead on the turn, like gut shots, open and straight draws, that kind of thing. King 3 here will just be a check fold. I mean, it's just not good enough with only one overcard and a backdoor draw to actually defend there, and I'm not going to have a raising range on that board, because if I do, it's very hard to balance it without having like very few bluff combos, so it's just almost not worth it at all. And it caps my calling range unnecessarily in a spot where my opponent has a much stronger range than I do, so that's not a texture that I'm going to seek to raise with anything in my range as part of a balance strategy. Sometimes you'll have a choice between several balanced strategies and you need to figure out which one is best in terms of how you divide up the various hands in your range. This is also close, but I'm going to, again, widen my button opening strategy here to be over folding to three bets, over stealing, over bluffing when I open, I suppose you could say, because I've got a fish in the big blind and a tightish player in the small blind. I just think I've got enough fold equity and stuff here. Um, 7, 8 in the cutoff, I would open this if the button were a little tighter and the big blind wasn't 8% 3 betting. If the big blind was a bit tighter there, I'd actually open that hand in the cutoff for sure. And again, just make that exploitative adjustment. I'm going to make an exploitative adjustment here. This guy's 3 bet is 19 so far, 3 out of 16. So I'm actually just going to start folding more of my small blinds. Like that ace 3 is a pretty tight fold, but so often when these guys are like semi aggro fishy regs like that with those kind of stats, they end up just 3 betting in obscene amounts. And the best exploitative strategy is to under-steal and over-defend your opening range against that. So there's just so frequently, like I said at the start of this video in the presentation part, it's so, so often that you're granted opportunities in Zoom to deviate from a balanced strategy in order to exploit the population or player types, basically. And there are obvious imbalances everywhere, and you really don't need to be... You don't need to be like knowing loads about your opponents or taking vigorous notes to find those imbalances. You really don't. So I flatted 6-5 here. 
on table three because the guy behind me, over 106 hands, just hasn't been active, hasn't been very three bet or anything like that at all. Um, I don't see a clear fish on table two, so I'm just going to open this my standard size. Ace King without a backdoor draw here against this player, I think, is a check just exploitatively. I don't really want to go into like um, super balanced strategies against someone whose range is pretty well defined. I mean, it's pocket pairs and things that hit the queen mainly. Um, so I think this is just a check fold on this texture. It's a pretty awful texture for me. So I'm just going to check fold every hand. I'm going to play my hands in a vacuum there because I don't feel like it's important to be balanced because I have a clear route to exploiting that player type. His range is kind of face up, like when he calls the three bet there. Um, and he's that kind of player. So it's a really easy um, just fold with Ace King there because check fold because I'm just not going to have the equity to, to get it in on that flop against his range. I have better hands to call with here. I don't know how often this player stabs three way on the river. Usually people don't stab enough in this situation. So I think population wise, I should slightly overfold my range here. Also the burden of defense and how often I actually need to call is really, um, is made a lot better by the fact that this dude here is going to be calling sometimes and he has some of the burden of defense as well. When he calls, it's like a very obvious fold. You could even consider a raise there, I guess, but I mean, you block pocket sixes, which is one value combo. No one should have that strong a range. You could consider um, raising there. The guy leads ace nine there, which I think is okay with ace of clubs. I think it's low enough down his range that he probably should be trying to steal the pot in the river with that part of it, um, probably. That's not a tragedy that I folded that hand there. Okay, so we three bet kings, and we're just going to go for three streets now. I'm going to bet flop turn and river all in. He can have aces sometimes, but you can give him these a net, but you can also have queens, jacks, that kind of thing. I don't expect them to have lots of flushes. It's kind of close without the king of hearts as to whether or not like there are some hands like ace, queen, ace, jack of hearts that make flushes here. Um, but I think in general, we can still go for three streets due to the frequency that aces is going to actually four bet us um, before the flop. It's going to be like most of the time. Um, this dude goes ahead and three bets us cutoff versus hijack. I'm just going to flat with jacks. And now it's just a very clear check back when we don't have a heart in our hand and unfortunately he gets there with the queen of hearts. So that hand's pretty standard, it's like the bottom of our value range, we're just tripling away with it and we'd have a bluffing range there as well. We On that river we probably wouldn't have much air because a lot of our turn bluffs would contain hearts. With jacks here I'm actually going to peel one streak because it's definitely too high up in my range to just give up immediately and people do. I think the population does one and done this spot pretty often when they're three bit bluffing here or have like ace queen or whatever and we're going to just fold the turn and continue with our king x there and it's going to be hard for us to defend too much on that that run out but it should be okay to play our range in that way and sort of para pyramidally we are shrinking our range we start at the base of the pyramid with like a the range we call the three bit with we fold some of it on the flop so the pyramid gets narrower and we fold more of it on the turn basically as well king jack is going to be one of my bluffs on this flop because i have made a gut shot and I may barrel some turn cards there as well, but I prefer to have, like, it depends what the turn is, um, that may become a, a barrel, it may not, depending how the rest of my range improves equity and where it is suitability-wise compared to the rest of my range. So I'm always thinking about my range here. You know, you're not going to see me in Zoom sit down and make decisions totally in a vacuum when I'm not against a fish with, like, a lot of good information or I'm not against someone that I know how to play perfectly against in a vacuum. If I don't know how to play well in a vacuum, I'm going to play my range, like, balanced. Um... This spot here is kind of close to a call. There's a bunch of implied odds here. I think I've just about got enough to peel this. Plus there's some flops like that that I'm maybe kind of semi-happy on anyway, depending on the flop action. Ace 4 off, I could throw into my polarized 3-bit bluff range in this spot, I think. Just start, starting off polar in the big blind here. And 3-better goes ahead and c-bets this 3-way. That's not to say that he necessarily has just like all over pairs here. I think I should peel this. I'm getting 3-1, to one, getting a pretty good price. Um, awful turn, just going to fold even to the men bet there. And he gets peeled there. So this is, we're normally looking at pocket pairs here. So basically we have 6 outs most of the time here. Maybe even slightly less. 6 outs getting 3-1. to one. It's kind of close with implied odds, but I think like... A lot of turns are going to be hearts that make us a straight. Uh, that's kind of close. It might be a call. It might be a fold. I'm not sure. I just think that it's a very clear situation where we have enough info to play the spot in a vacuum and just play against the, the info that we have there because 
I'm pretty confident that we just always have no more than six outs in that spot. So we're getting slightly better than three to one with six outs. It's kind of close. If there's a bit of implied odds as well, that's going to make it a call probably, depending. So maybe I missed a slightly profitable call there actually. Probably it's a call actually. But we live and learn. Not not got much time to make these decisions and then talk. So I may make some mistakes, but I'll comment on the mistakes that I make and say why they're mistakes. Here, this guy folds a lot, so with my range, I'm actually just making my size smaller to capitalize on all the extra fold equity. And I'm gonna just delay to see about this hand here against the fish, because I think like they're gonna play like fairly straightforwardly. I'm gonna make a small turn bet here, laying myself a good price to pick up this pot, and I'm just gonna give up river because when a fish snap calls turn there, he's just never folding king x in the river. One there's like one slight disadvantage to delayed sea betting over sea betting. And that's that. I probably should have just sea bet actually because I'm against the fish and it doesn't matter, but I didn't notice the stack size, so I was going for like a more balanced um strategy in that spot. I'm just gonna go ahead and bet this flop pretty big because it's a flop that I do have a substantial check give up range on, and so my sea bet range is gonna be much more equity heavy, if not value heavy. So my sizing therefore should be bigger with my range, it just makes more sense because I'm not trying to give myself a great price on a flop steel C bet like I would be on like king 8 8 rainbow or whatever and there are a lot of hands at Villain can pot control and check back you're like king 9 king queen king 8 jack queen jack 9 10 9 10, 10 queen exact etc stuff like that so again I'm just gonna continue blasting away here for value with my nuts that's me playing the hand kind of like in a vacuum um, in terms of my strategy here, I would I would be bluffing a bunch as well. Like I'd be bluffing a kind of balanced amount of just less than half my range on that turn would be like kind of semi bluffs, um, which is fine because a lot of the semi bluffs I have have good equity as well, and it's hard for Villain to realize all of the equity he has on the turn I improve and he can't get to show down and stuff like that. I'm gonna just go ahead and make a big river value bet here because my range is gonna be polarized. I'm gonna have things that missed. I was bluffing with them, I got very strong hands for value. I'm not gonna bet like, you know, get king nine for three streets there or anything like that. So because I'm polarized, it makes sense to go big for sizing and um, to make villain make it harder for villain to like um bluff catch and stuff like that. I do have a bunch of air in my range, so big sizing is gonna be good there. This guy looks like a fish, but he has opened under the gun, he has been quite tight, so I'm gonna like to just peel this instead of three bet for value. I could have considered actually stabbing there, but I do have a tight player on the button who has a more pocket pair heavy range. So I think the check is reasonable. And preflop razor actually check calls that flop three-way, which is something I would note if I wasn't involved in all these other hands and stuff. And talking to you guys, um, then you know that the guy does have a calling range on a board where a lot of his hands are going to be vulnerable. And you're going to want C-bet. He does check call some hands there, so it's kind of good to know that. Helps you design your own stabbing frequencies and that kind of thing. I'm just going to assume this guy's going to play like fairly fair or fold when he's a fish that checks back flop. And when he gets to this river here, he has some ace-king that beats me. He has a lot of just like one pair hands and stuff that I think are going to call. I'm not going to bet too huge. Just going to try and get calls from things like pocket 10s, pocket 8s, 9x, that kind of thing. 9s is just, we're going to be playing balance in this spot. Um, gold star guy goes ahead. I think 9s is good enough to cold call in position here. Just about, it's kind of like the bottom of my cold call range. I'll cold call some big cards there as well. I'm going to flat queens here just to start with and have a very polarized um, three bet range in this spot. I found getting in queens in this situation is not like super profitable. I have a lot of queen x in my range here, so I'm not worried about just calling flop folding turn in this situation with a two out under pair. And I think turns are pretty easy check back here because he can be checking some better hands, so protection's not like as big a deal. And we're just going to go through ever and usually win. Which is fine. Um, queens, we are going to go ahead and bet now that preflop razor checks. We're three way. There's some protection to be gained here on table two, and it's just going to be a balanced strategy. That's going to be in our value range. We're going to be stabbing sometimes with the air as well. It's just a clear bet. So yeah, you don't want to cold call too wide there because your range is going to be capped because you're going to be playing a four bet game in that situation for value as a bluff. And all of that. This guy looks to be a fish, so I'm just gonna go ahead and three bet this hand for value, slash isolate the fish, slash gain the initiative. It's kind of thin. One thing I always say to my students in these spots is you don't need to be, especially in position, what I'm about to say is more true in position, but you don't need to be a huge favorite against the fish's range here to actually go ahead and value three bet. You just need to be in decent shape and have like advantages like, like initiative and that kind of thing. You 
just snapping down here. I mean, it's when a fish has timing like this, it just makes it incredibly unlikely he's going to decide to fall to on the river. So I think it's a clear give up when all our, our draws brick here, for sure. Like, Jack X is just probably not going anywhere. We block all the draws um, that he could have. Um, he could have a worse flush draw, but it's a very tiny part of his range compared to all the just the Jack X and King X and things like that. So pretty clear check fold give up for us. This spot, I think we can just flat with these three suited. It's better if they're deeper, but it should be absolutely fine. Going to overbluff our range in this spot, which is going to make three betting King nine fine because this guy's just a net. He's like 14, 11. But that doesn't mean he's going to be super tight on the button specifically. And he's got 100% full to three bet so far, which I expect to be kind of accurate with that player type. It's not that I'm taking that stat alone as accurate, but coupled with its with the guy's VPIP and PFR, I think that he's just clearly going to be a player that's overfolding his button range there to a three bet. And therefore, I want to go a bit wider linear from the small blind than I would normally just to capitalize on that extra fold equity and not worrying about being counter exploited by four bets because I have the player type breed that he's not going to be doing that very often and therefore it's going to be totally fine for me just to go down that road and accept that if I do get 4-bet I'm folding loads of my range to it but I don't think that's happening often so I'm playing very much exploitatively against a player type in that situation. The most common player types you'll exploit in Zoom are going to be regs, uh, sorry, nits and fish. You're generally not going to be like exploiting a reg with a player type breed because regs are more balanced. Like you look at a reg, they're going to be playing like in a more sensible way so you're generally not going to be like just flat out exploiting them. I'm going to check call a weak top pair here. Um, I think fish like tend to just bet quite automatically in this spot. If my top pair were stronger, I'd probably go ahead and just like start value betting multiple streets. But I think this is a nice hand just to just to check call. Um, I really like value bet a dollar here. Try and get called by like ace high, 9x, 5x. I think he bets king x on the turn most of the time. So I should be good there. Should be able to make a thin value bet just in the war in that spot. But there are better jacks that will call me. But I think there's enough worse hands to outweigh them. If I go small enough and not too big. Clear check back here. I have a checking range on this board. It's not great for me to see that, so I'm checking a bunch of stuff. Tens is just some of the showdown value I'm checking back. Clear call turn fold river as well. And this run out, I'm just too low down in my range to really do anything else. He leads twos there, which I guess is okay, given it's like the very bottom of his, is very close to like the, the bottom of his range in that situation. I'm always looking for reasons to open ace 10 off under the gun, but I don't really have one there. Don't really have a table that's you know either folding loads when they're in position or calling and playing badly out of the blinds or anything like that, which would be the criteria I would use for widening my under the gun opening range to include something like ace ten. Clear call here, blind versus blind against the men open as most hands are going to be. Should not be three betting all that many hands there. Should be three betting polar like for value then with some bluffs, but compared to your calling range, your three bet and your folding range there are not going to be that big. Like your folding range will still be some hands. But more than like half the hands in the deck there will just be calls against the men open blind versus blind and a good balance strategy that defends enough. Gonna check back because I have king high so I have some showdown value. I'm just gonna call this turn if he bets. So I really just can't rep very many value combos by raising here. And that 10 is a pretty good card for me because I have a lot of 10x in this spot. So it's good for my range. It makes my range a lot stronger certainly. Um, I don't think villain should have that much 10x so I'm probably going to consider having a raising range on this river because I have 10x for value and I'm going to have an overbet bluff range here and I'm going to like value bet my 10x for this size as well as my bluffs to try and get folds from ace x, weak ace x or something like that basically. I think overbetting that river is a good way to go. Um, we 3 bet here, get called, we're going to go ahead and c bet this flop, we pick up a lot of equity against the fish and we can consider just shoving those turn cards as well just with all that equity it should be absolutely fine we'll get bet call flop and shove turn of call basically and that's gonna be all good so this is an easy game honestly poker's simple just break it down when you break it down into this kind of base strategy figure out what balance is you know do a lot of work on balance on your own figure out what it looks like and then from there build some exploitative strategies. Like this here is exploitative. This guy's 1913 with 100% fold to three bet. He's probably over folding to three bets. Therefore, I'm going to go ahead and have a much wider three bet bluff range. Okay, maybe this is like taking the piss a little bit. This might be like too wide, um, but I think it should be fine. Clear call, turn, evaluate, river in my hand. On that river, I think I'm too high up in my range to fold because I actually don't have that many better hands here. I'm going to bet my better 10x on the flop. I have some weak 10x here, some 8s and 9s and then 7x and then I have a lot of ace king, ace queen. So I'm just too high up in my range to fold. I'm just going to play a balanced strategy. And you know, villain just shouldn't have that many value combos there as well. Like sure he's tight so far, 
but he shouldn't have like heaps of value combos in that situation because nets tend not to value bet so thin so if he was going to bet nines on that river for value i'd be kind of surprised so I expect him to have like good 10x plus for value and then a bunch of bluffs and then like i only need like i need less than 33 percent equity to call there by quite some margin so his bet size is relatively small compared to the pot and so you know if he's only even if he's just bluffing that river like some small amount of the time i'm gonna have a call there so i'm actually probably gonna overcall my range because i think the population's over bluffing that spot because they're not aware of just how few value combos they have and they're just betting air without really thinking about it i won't comment on like ridiculously standard hands like flatting jacks and then folding to a c-bet on king queen three i think it's just like totally completely standard so i'm not going to bother about spots like that what I will bother about is how long I've been recording for, so I can keep this video about where I want it. Yeah, so we're going to wrap up in a minute. Um, hopefully this has been pretty instructive for you guys, and you can see that the stuff I talked about last week with the rock, paper, scissors, and the stuff I talked about today in presentation mode, you know, this stuff is not like... Mm, King Deuce here is probably going to be a 3-bit. This stuff is not you know, totally unapply unapplicable. I can apply it in game, I can apply it when I've only got eight seconds to decide. I can quickly ramble through how I think I should be playing these spots. Um Jack Eight here's like at the bottom of my folding range, so I think that against a guy over folding to three bets so far, I should just be polar here. I think the fish is gonna fall to a squeeze in that situation enough as well that polar three bet strategy is gonna be good. Um we get four bet, cold four bet by the small blind who I don't know much about. People don't tend to bluff too much in this situation in these games I've noticed, so they just can't be bothered because assume they can hit fast fold. So I like four bet bluff I suppose. So we'll hit set out next big blind. This guy is like platinum star but short, I don't really know what to make of that but he seems on the tight side anyway so I'm not going to make my sizing bigger. I would if he was like a looser, a looser short stack. Got two players who could potentially be fish here, so we're gonna 3x the button on table three. And just fold that hand to a very large um, three bit. Flop a set, just gonna go ahead and barrel three times. That's a great card. Um I could I think betting is better than Actually, we are kind of deep here, so check raising might be... Yeah, I'm giving up that turn a lot. This is definitely a check raise on the turn this deep for value. I could check raise bluff this as well, I suppose, but in practice, you know, I probably wouldn't, to be honest. He has king x most of the time here, so we're just going to bet really big, like, in polarizing. He just folds. I don't really know what to make of his range in that situation, quite honestly. Maybe, like, some gut shot, like, jack 10, queen 10, or something like that, I suppose. Um, this dude is short and nitty, so we're going to overfold our range and fold ace-10. That would never be a fold under normal circumstances, but again, player type breed. We have that, we're in the beige zone, we have the player type breed, we can go ahead and overfold our range, we don't need to worry about it. Definitely men open against someone who can be shoving wide, it's just much better when you can't call that shove, or with your whole range actually. And ace-deuce here on king-9-4, I think we can see back close to our whole range against a really loose guy, especially when we have like a back there flush shot, it's just undoubtedly going to be fine. And our range is stronger when we open under the gun, so we can actually afford to go ahead and make it like fairly um, fairly large compared to what we would if we were on the button with our sizing there. Um, we make the nuts on the river, which is pretty nice. I don't ever expect them to have six, seven in a million years, so I'm just going to continue to bet fairly big here as we would with our bluffs and things like that. Not huge, because there are some like value hands we want to bet this size that aren't super strong, like Ace King and things like that. So I think a bet of 1050 is going to be going to be fine on this river with our whole range. <clears throat> we bet turn because we don't just want our turn barrel range to be clubs because on club rivers we'd like to be able to bluff with that extra fold equity as well. So we don't just want to barrel clubs on the turn, we want to barrel like other equity too. And if we're not barreling a gut shot here, it's not clear what other other equity we are barreling, if that makes sense. Alright guys, so this has been Characters. I hope you've enjoyed this video. I hope it's been a nice sort of mix and mesh of theory and practice. In the next video, we'll be doing something that I haven't decided yet, but I will logically follow the progression of the series. Leave me comments, feedback. <clears throat> Let me know what you think, questions, whatever. And if you want to get in touch about private coaching, if you play Zoom games or regular 6 Max games or whatever, then you can check out my stuff at carrotcorner.com. You can check out prices and things like I always say. And email me, 
if you want to get in touch for any reason at admin at carrotcorner.com and I'll see you guys on the next video next week. Good luck.